Hello everyone. In a big city like Istanbul, it's not easy to visit different art galleries in one day. Luckily, an interdisciplinary art project has brought many of them together in one of the city's most bustling areas. Esra Durust went to check it out. Time Out magazine recently ranked the top streets in the world for food, fun, culture and community. And Suleyman Seba Street from Istanbul made it to the list. But we're not here for a coffee today. Instead, we're going to explore inside these historic buildings to enjoy some art. That's because Art Weeks is back at the trendy neighborhood of Akaretler for its seventh edition. And this time, with works from 24 galleries and independent artists, it has more on offer. This project, which we carried out to support Turkish contemporary art, especially its economy, becomes much more interesting with a display of contemporary art from a contrasting place that's historically very valuable for all of us. Art Week aims to draw people from all over Istanbul in one central spot. It's free to visit and also brings art enthusiasts and artists together. And as we explore the exhibition venues, we come across John Madan, whose inspiration comes from literature, mythology and coffee fortune telling. I have a very surrealist approach. I also have ties to the American abstract expressionists. My father is poet and translator Said Madan. He has a relationship with world mythologies. Our childhood was spent listening to those mythologies. I also love Jorge Luis Borges. I've read his book Imaginary Beings maybe 10 times. I was very impressed with those myths. And Madan isn't the only artist who is inspired by writers. The subject of my works is related to literature and music. I always produce works inspired by them. I'm also inspired by some of the lyrics. Lyle Batman, on the other hand, merges art with cinematography, and she uses contrasting materials such as wood and aluminium, as she did to create this work especially for this event. It consists of three different scenes where I convey what are we experiencing socially, globally and culturally today, the war, the economic crisis, the state of ecology, and the scenes where I convey what I'm going through today. We are going through a process where some actions are taken and uncertainties are also dominant, and I try to reflect them. For artists, the event is a chance to showcase their work and tell the stories behind them. And for visitors, that means getting a good dose of art for free on a highly cool street. That's why the organizers call Art Weeks at Akaretler a celebration for anyone who wants to catch up with today's art trends or just take a break to feel the joy of living. Esra Drust, TRT World. The original Manchurian candidate is considered one of the best examples of 1960s Cold War paranoia. It has murder carried out by sleeper agents at its core and a tangled web of political intrigue to make it even more complex. In our movie Almanac, Ali Jan investigates if this conspiracy classic is still relevant today. The Manchurian Candidate tells the story of a brainwashed American programmed to assassinate a political figure, sleeper agents, foreign influence on national politics, world leaders using lethal tactics to seize power are themes that were received as ahead of their time when the movie was released. Remember, the year was 1962. It was right after the peak of the Cold War and a little before the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Also, a few years earlier, the Dwight Eisenhower, Adlai Stevenson election race had happened. And critics say all that was poured into the story. The film is essentially a mix 
of world affairs making headlines at the time. The war in Korea was over. And to get the public to see it, the producers used one of America's most famous stars, Frank Sinatra. But the picture wasn't a smash hit with 1960s America. Scholars say comedy was the popular genre at the time. And with the murder of President JFK, the flick was eventually pulled out of circulation. <laughs> Mr. Secretary! So 60 years later, does a movie as time-specific as The Manchurian Candidate have something to say to contemporary audiences? The Rotten Tomatoes website believes so. Given the global power struggle is still alive and kicking, it calls the movie distressingly relevant, even in this day and age. Raymond, why don't you pass the time by playing a little solitaire? The late Roger Ebert agrees, saying even decades later, the topics that make up the Manchurian candidate are still alive. And their final verdict is that while the technology of similar clandestine activities might have changed, the movie endures because of its depiction of how true believers of a cause may well end up becoming game pieces for the power hungry. You couldn't have stopped them. The army couldn't have stopped them. So I had to. That's why I didn't call. Them. When director Eric Apple made a fake trailer for an Al Yankovic biopic back in 2010, he had no plans to make the actual film. But now he has. And it turned out to be just as weird as the character itself. Daniel Radcliffe stars in Weird, the Al Yankovic story, a biographical parody film loosely based on the life of the American singer. Just stop being who you are and doing the things you love. So far, critics have called it utterly absurd, wildly eccentric, and gloriously ridiculous. Well, that's not so different from what Weird Al's songs, such as Living with a Hernia, My Bologna, and others have been called before. Its director Eric Appel says the idea for the whole thing started as a joke with the old fake trailer he made. And over the past decade, people kept asking him when he would release the actual film. But Appel knew he had to consider it once he found out Weird Al was seriously into it. You know, with Bohemian Rhapsody and Rocket Man was coming out and, and biopics were back in the zeitgeist. and. You know, I got this random email from Al in, in 2019 that was like, you know, it's time. Let's do this. <laughs> and I jumped at it immediately. I, I mean, but I, I, I didn't think we would actually pull it off, you know? It's, it's very exciting. Radcliffe feels the same and is thrilled to be part of the film co-written by Weird Al, who makes fun of both his own and other characters' lives. It was kind of just going, oh, what else could... Weird Al's biopic have been except a parody of biopics. Like, it, it, I didn't know what to expect when I read it, and then I started reading it, and I was like, oh, right, of course it's this, and it's, it's perfect. The singer has mocked many artists in the past, from Michael Jackson... ...to Madonna. And the Queen of Pop is also in the biopic. She's played by Evan Rachel Wood. Though the rumours about the two singers having a relationship were never confirmed, the film plays with that idea. Uh, I hope she, she laughs about it. She clearly has a sense of humour because, you know, he covered like a surgeon and I'm sure she's heard it and I'm sure she loves it. And so it's, it's, a, it's a funny homage to her and to that time. And again, it's not really exactly supposed to be Madonna, so we could have a little fun and some liberties with it. So it was it was the way I prefer to do it. In front of all the billions of people watching around the world right now. One Weird Al song goes, Dare to be stupid, we're all waiting for you, let's go. Well, in this case, it should go, Dare to be weird, as this film calls people to embrace their weirdness and never look back.
fictional undercover journalist Irvin M. Fletch Fletcher last made headlines three decades ago with the movie Fletch Lives. And after several failed attempts, he finally managed to get a new lead story with Confess Fletch. Ali Jan has a scoop. Earl Maurice Fletcher, they caught me in the middle of a yawn. Can you imagine that? In his recent outing, Fletch helps his girlfriend get back her father's stolen expensive paintings. But along the way, he becomes a suspect in the murder of a woman. Now, there may be those who are not familiar with the wacky investigative journalist, who is famous for finding himself in similar pickles. To your criminal record, and you're a bit of a shady character, Mr. Fletcher. What is this man's name? My name is Igor Stravinsky. Hi there, I'm uh, Harry S. Truman. I'm uh, Don Corleone. Based on the books by author Gregory MacDonald, the character had a heyday at the movies when Chevy Chase held the title role. Chase's riff was that of a self-confident, at times klutzy jokester. And it was that quality which made it a cult favorite performance. After two movies, however, the franchise was shelved in the late 1980s. In the 2000s, Hollywood attempted to bring Fletch back, first with Zach Braff of Scrubs fame, and then with Dawson's Creek's Joshua Jackson. Who killed this young woman? I think the victim interrupted an art theft. Flash forward to 2022. It's Mad Men's John Hamm who gets to fill Chase's shoes. You want my help? Okay. Hey, guys, this is the way we can call in a coffee. Right? And critics seem to be all for it. LA Time calls his performance a masterclass with a fortless charm. His fletch may be less jokey, and the performance low key when compared to Chase's. But the sarcasm is still there. Maybe you should get that gun. And reviews point out there's more brains and kindness this time around. In the end, critics agree Confess Fletch is a worthy successor because it never sacrifices the character's intelligence for the sake of a punchline. And hopefully, contemporary Hollywood is taking note. Are you Fletcher? Yes, I am. Oh. I mean, no, I'm not. I always get that wrong. Florence Pugh went from portraying a Marvel super spy to a Californian housewife in the past couple of years. But now, with her latest film, The Wonder, she says she's going back to her roots. It's not your job to question us. You are here only to watch. English nurse Lib is brought to a tiny village in Ireland to watch over a girl who hasn't eaten in months. As the girl is miraculously alive, she soon attracts tourists and pilgrims who think of her as a potential saint. But Lib has her suspicions, and her call for facts isn't welcomed by locals. Anna O'Donnell doesn't eat. The Wonder is a period drama set in 1862, and for the film star Florence Pugh, that's perfect. After her roles in movies such as Lady Macbeth and Outlaw King, Pew says it feels good to be back in the countryside. And how does that feel? It was one of those beautiful little proper period films that you really kind of like, you will have to be into it 110% and you all have to be dirty for two months and you all mm -hmm. have to work in, in, in sets that have muddy floors. And to me, that is, I mean, that's my roots. That's where I came from. So it feels, it felt really exciting to get back into, I suppose, the dirty film. <laughs> <laughs> but it was the character of Lib that attracted her to the film, a Nightingale nurse making a case that no one wants to hear. Very well, Father, thank you. They were seen as angels, they were seen as these people that would give up their lives to come and help uh, soldiers, and then after that they would, you know, be these very, very well-trained nurses. And so the idea of this very proud woman who has a lot on her CV to come over to come and help this village, and then this village doesn't want her, and she just has to sit there and watch, 
is a very interesting um, twist on on who this woman is, how good she is at her job. Um, that is the fascinating. That was the fascinating part for me. Yeah. The Wanda has received generally favorable reviews from critics. They've also praised Pew for her remarkable performance. Although Pew says she feels at home on muddy film sets, she's also glad this exhausting experience in the countryside is over. Her upcoming projects include an animated comedy and a science fiction film. But after that break, Pew might want to return to her roots once again. Amaldus Fountain picks up the royal baton as the latest actor to play Queen Elizabeth in the hit Netflix drama The Crown. But the new season has drawn backlash for the way it portrays a tough period for the British royal family so soon after the monarch's death. Have royal scandals damaged the country's reputation? The House of Windsor should be binding the nation together. Well, th this um, time in the royal family's life was, uh, as you know, uh, very tumultuous, and uh, the writers didn't shy away from any difficult um, issues. It's a situation that cannot help but affect the stability of the country. I think the idea that there is a need for a disclaimer is you know, a little bit patronizing. After four seasons, I think people around the world are well aware that this is a drama based on real events. I think yeah. nerve endings are still raw and people are feeling very protective. I think if this was coming out two years ago, I don't think any of this would be going on. And it's understandable. Of course it is. What's that look? Libyan artist Adnan al karfani paints portraits of characters inspired by the animation series he used to watch as a child. His exhibition in Tripoli is now letting kids tag along as their parents take a trip down memory lane. These paintings take us back to a beautiful time. They take us back over 30 years when they taught us a lot of positive things. Such as Grandire, who defends his country. Flona, who is patient. Adnan and Lena, who taught us courage. Silver also, from Treasure Island. They always used to give us something that is absent today, which is that good always wins over evil. So this gives you an optimistic outlook on life. It was a chance for my kids to see the animations that used to be broadcast when I was 10 or 11 years old and they are still in our imagination. And even when they broadcast them today, we still watch them with our children. Maria Bartoshova produced around 500 sculptures in her lifetime, ranging from small pieces to larger commissions for public spaces. Yet, she was rarely known. But now, an exhibit aims to change that. 
Maria Bartosova was born in 1936 in the capital of former Czechoslovakia. She moved from Prague to Košice in the 1960s, where she practiced her profession and looked after her children. And although her works were displayed during her lifetime, she had only a few solo exhibits. And it was only after her work featured in the art show documented in 2007 that she began gaining attraction on the global scene. Now Tate Modern hosts the first major UK show of Bartsova that includes plaster sculptures which reflect her primary choice of material. It's a 30-year career survey spanning works from the early 60s to the late 80s and really explores her continual experimentation to find a new sculptural language. Playing with our daughter inspired Bartsova to use party balloons for casting plaster. With that technique, she was able to create abstract shapes as well as pure and delicate sculptures. And her works evoking raindrops, seeds, eggs and the human body are mostly related to nature. I think this is something in her language, in her shapes that could uh, invite and, uh, to other people to understand her work because she used a minimalist form and colors. But the, these forms, shapes, colors are important for us and she always connect them with the nature. Bartosova's larger pieces were commissioned by the state as new government buildings in 1960s Czechoslovakia had to include public art and the curator of the show says it was no easy task. During Bartosova's lifetime she worked with certain political constraints because she lived in the former Eastern Bloc. Uh, she wrote in her journals about the difficulty she experienced living in a totalitarian regime and unable to express artists, unable to express themselves fully. Uh, she also lived away from the centre, which at the time was Prague, and lived in an industrial city of Kozice. So she had a relatively secluded life, also to do with her own personality. The exhibit is an important contribution by the gallery in highlighting lesser-known female artists in history and a celebration of Maria Bartsova in hopes that she finally gets the recognition she deserves. Surrealism began as an artistic and literary movement in the early 20th century, but it soon also came to the fore in the design scene. Now, a new exhibit in London explores that relationship. When it comes to surrealism, it's almost impossible not to think of Salvador Dali. So London's Design Museum's new show, Objects of Desire, Surrealism and Design 1924 to Today, puts a spotlight on many of his works to explore the influence of the artistic moment on design. The famous lobster telephone, which Dali used in his London house, as well as his lip-shaped sofa can be seen alongside other quirky items and curators gathered them to show how a daily object can be imagined in a new context and turn to a piece of design. The Cerritos looked at the world and thought, how could this be different? You know, how could it reflect not just what we need from a functional perspective, but also what we need from an emotional and imaginative point of view in our lives, in our homes, how can we express ourselves and these are still such key modern concerns and I think that's, that's why these objects still speak to us. But Johnson says this isn't just about Dali or surrealist artists. So Marcel Duchamp's bottle rack and the Campana brothers' cartoon chair made from plush Disney characters also stand out. Also featured are more recent pieces such as Bjork's dreamlike video clips and contemporary designer Najla El Zayn's sensory brush of hay inserted in a porcelain base. There's a real synergy between surrealism and the sort of pop art uh, movements and the exaggerated forms and fantastical forms that you see in furniture design, particularly at that moment um, and it also looks at the ready-made we have Duchamp's 
Johnson adds that surrealism was always concerned with the mind, and this exhibition focuses on how changing ways of thinking can bring about various types of objects. So she hopes that the show will inspire visitors and maybe go away to create some surrealist works of their own. That's it for this episode of Showcase with me, Elif Bereketli. From me and the whole team here in Istanbul, thank you for watching and goodbye for now.